morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the late start. Um, let's go ahead and open in prayer and just dive right in. Father God, thank you for this day that you've made. Thank you that we can rejoice and be glad in it because we have a God who uh, was not content to be separate and apart from us, but who uh, became incarnate, became man uh, through the Virgin Mary and through the Holy Spirit, that he might redeem us from our sin and from death and from the devil, and he might um, make us a part of his body, which is the church, and that we may grow up in it, into him, uh, more and more each day, uh, sharpening one another as iron sharpens iron, and be presented uh, to him at the second coming as a faultless bride uh, clothed in the white robe of Christ's righteousness. We thank you for this. We pray that you would be with us as we look into uh, more of the church fathers, uh, including St. Ignatius, that you would uh, help us to learn from them uh, as they learned from you, and that we would uh, take to heart some of the things that, uh, that they taught thousands of years ago and see uh, what an application it has for uh, your church and for each of us individually today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So we uh, have some key concepts we've uh, covered so far in the introduction to the uh, Apostolic Fathers and specifically Clement of Rome. Uh, we've uh, been talking a lot about church unity and learned that uh, schism should be unknown to those chosen by God, according to Clement. Uh, that pride and jealousy alienate us from one another uh, and from God, and they divide the church. Uh, we learned that heresy, which is wrong doctrine or self-thought, and schism, which is divisions among the church, those two things are two sides, opposite sides, of the same coin. We learned that God desires repentance from schism, and we discussed the three types of unity that we are called to, unity of doctrine, unity uh, of church order, and unity in the Holy Spirit. Um, and we learned that Christ is our example of servant leadership for officers in the church that God governed church order and worship in the Old Covenant, and that he continues to govern it uh, in accordance with his will in the New Covenant today. And finally, we learn that those who rebel against the order established by God for his worship, uh, if they do not repent, will receive judgment. Today, we're going to introduce a new um, character in the... Uh, among the church fathers, and that is Ignatius of Antioch. And uh, most of you should have a handout. If you need one, just let me know. But we'll just kind of go through that a little bit. Ignatius became a believer at a young age. Uh, tradition holds, and of course, uh, we, we, we have no documents to back up this tradition. It's not in the scriptures, but um, historians have been saying for some time that he was likely one of the children brought to Jesus uh, when the disciples were turning them away. Uh, one of those children to whom Jesus said, let the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And if that is true, certainly Ignatius is uh, one of those who spent his life serving his king and uh, bringing that kingdom uh, to bear on the world. He was taught and discipled by the apostle John, and he likely knew both Peter and Paul personally. He was also a close friend to Polycarp, who was the Bishop of Smyrna, and who we may, uh, if time allows in the, in the course, we may talk about briefly uh, with regard to his uh, Polycarp, Polycarp's martyrdom. Um, later in life, uh, Ignatius was ordained the Bishop of Antioch, which was in Syria. Uh, that was an important Greek city founded by one of Alexander the Great's generals in a few hundred years BC. Uh, and it was one of the great cities of the East, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, sometimes at times even rivaling Alexandria in its importance for trade. Uh, it was also the uh, center of Second Temple Judaism, uh, kind of in the diaspora. There were many, many Jews in Antioch, uh, and it was a center 
of Jewish thought uh, and theology. Uh, it's mentioned many times in the scriptures. Uh, the book of Acts discusses Antioch, where it says they were first called Christians in Antioch. So, uh, assuming he was there at the time, uh, Ignatius, as, as perhaps a lay member of the church, a young man, uh, was, was one of those who was first called Christians, and it's recorded in the scripture for us. He's also called Theophorus, which means God-bearer, and his calling was truly to bear the good news of the incarnate God to the lost world, and especially the region surrounding uh, modern-day Turkey, Syria, Asia Minor, and that's where he had his ministry. Uh, he served as bishop from approximately AD 70 to his death in the Colosseum at AD 107. By the time of his death, if not before, uh, all of Syria and Asia Minor had a mono-episcopal system of church government, and that simply means mono, one, episcopal is a hierarchical system with the bishops. So as we talked before, in discussing Clement of Rome at, at that time, which was around 95, uh, 80, 95, at least in Rome, uh, there was not a single bishop over the other bishops. There were a plurality of elders uh, uh, comprising what, we, what was called, and at least in the translations we have, a presbytery. It's from what we get our word Presbyterian. So that was very likely similar to our uh, what we would call our session. Yet in Rome, the uh, Clement was most likely kind of a first among equals there, somewhat equivalent to Sean as our teaching elder. Um, we're, in this book, uh, the books we're reading today, were probably written around 10 years later, uh, and they were not written from Rome. They were written by the bishop of one of the eastern churches, two other churches in the east. Uh, there's a total of six books. Uh, or seven books, six were written to churches in Asia, one was written to Rome. And that, uh, we'll get into some interesting uh, history of that a little later. But by the time of his death, uh, the idea of a three-office church comprising the bishop, the uh, pastors, elders, and the deacons was firmly established in the Eastern Empire. Now, when I say that he was the bishop and this three office church was established, uh, do not get the idea that it was a hierarchical system like we see today in the Church of Rome or the Eastern Orthodox Church where the bishops wear miters or funny hats and they have big ornate robes and they have long uh, <coughs> gold encrusted jewelry hanging from them. That was not the case at all. Uh, and if you had a chance to, to get a copy of these letters and read um, these letters, Ignatius, uh, as a person, and I believe as typical of the other bishops of the period, was the absolute paragon of servant leadership. He was not puffing himself up. He uh, viewed himself as the least of the kingdom of heaven, and repeatedly, uh, although he had been a believer for his whole life and a bishop for 37 years by this time, uh, said that he was, quote, only beginning to become a disciple. Uh, and, and, he, and he thought that the role of the bishop was very important, but yet he thought of himself, he was not worthy of the role, and he also uh, stressed the importance of the other offices, particularly the office of the deacon. Uh, it came in very strongly through his writings that, in fact, the deacon was the most important to office because it was the deacon who showed the, the servanthood and the humility of Christ in serving his people. And he had a very high view of the office of the deacon in his church, and as you can see in the letters as we read through them, uh, had very close relationships with the deacons, not only in his own church, but in the areas around. Uh, Ignatius, and this is important, did not base his support for the mono-episcopal or the one-bishop system on apostolic succession. Uh, he and the church fathers strongly, well, they didn't disagree with the concept because it hadn't been formulated, but were they transported a thousand years later when Rome was starting to claim the concept of apostolic succession uh, as the, the bishop of Rome 
uh, being a successor to the apostles in the apostolic ministry, Ignatius would have uh, clearly and vehemently denied this. Instead, he viewed his um, concept uh, based on God uh, in his word and through the apostles, uh, ordaining bishops and elders and uh, and then later on, as the church grew and needed uh, additional leadership, uh, that concept of, uh, of of elder became to have kind of a kind of a two prongs within that. Uh, the goal of which being church unity. Uh, it was it was it was a requirement as the church grew, and we'll get into that later on. But he but he did not believe in apostolic succession, as it is understood. Uh, in, in, the, in the Western Roman Church today. Ignatius was arrested during the reign of Trajan, uh, according to Eusebius, likely around AD 107. Uh, it was arrested in Antioch, and he was transported uh, overland uh, from Antioch all the way to Rome to be thrown to the wild beasts in the Colosseum. And it is during this, these travels that the now very old Ignatius writes these letters to the churches uh, along his route. Um, as they were, and you will see at the bottom of page two, there's a map, and on the bottom right hand corner is Antioch. That was uh, just above the southern border of modern day Turkey, just above Syria. At the time, it was considered part of Syria. So they traveled from there northwest to Tarsus, where Paul is from, and then over the uh, uh, Anatolia to uh, where there's nothing really there even today um, to, to Laodicea and at Laodicea they had a choice they could continue due west to the coast and then head north or they could take the northern uh, route so the uh, obviously Ignatius had no uh, say in which route they took but uh, they ended up taking the northern route and at that time uh, he wrote three of the letters to the church in uh, Ephesus, Magnesia, and Trallis. And I may be mispronouncing Trallis, so I apologize. Um, churches he thought he would be able to visit on the way, but turned out he could not. So he wrote three pastoral letters to them. Uh, they continued uh, northwest to Philadelphia, to Sardis, ending in Smyrna, which was the home of his friend Bishop Polycarp. Uh, Continuing from there, they went up to Troas and Philippi, and from there we really don't know the route they took because that's when he stopped writing letters. Uh, it is assumed that, uh, pursuant to the letters, other histories, he did end up in Rome, did end up in the Colosseum, and he was in fact eaten and digested by lions or other animals. Uh, there's actually some very graphic language in some of the letters where he speaks of uh, hoping to be faithful uh, in his martyrdom, not, uh, not deny the, the Lord, uh, and hoping that he, in fact, uh, is fully consumed by the beast because he does not want to be a burden to the believers in Rome to bury him. And um, as was often developing in this time, they, they would, would bury uh, their, the Christian, they believed in Christian burial as opposed to burning. Uh, as many of the pagans did. They would bury them and they would have little monuments to them. No one has found one for Ignatius. So it's very possible there really wasn't much left when uh, the beasts were done. Um, so they took that northern route. Uh, aside from these letters, very little has uh, survived regarding Ignatius or his writings, yet these seven letters are dense um, with important teachings on church government, on the ecclesiology, on the sacraments, and on uh, the proper response of believers to persecution. Um, as we discussed before with, yes? I was oh. just wondering why he was arrested. Um, for being a Christian. Yeah, um, that, that's the simple answer. I don't know exactly. Uh, typically, the, um, the, when they had the various persecutions by the empire, which this was during that time, they would seek out particularly uh, outspoken church leaders uh, and make an example of them with the goal of uh, frightening the other believers, uh, confusing the flock, and uh, throwing the church into chaos. Um, and 
Ignatius actually does speak to that in the letters too. He's uh, praying, he asks for prayer for his church at Antioch, who's without a shepherd, and says they, and he, he, he says they have no uh, physical shepherd on earth. They must rely on their heavenly shepherd, Jesus Christ, who's more than sufficient to take care of them in this time of trouble. And, um, but he shows great concern for them. And actually, in the last letters, he has learned from the deacons at um, Antioch that order has been restored in the church and that the church is doing well, and he rejoices in that. So a very good, very good question. We, just some type of general persecution, probably singled out because it's bigger. Um, so Ignatius, uh, we, we focus on several things in his letter. There's three main points he has. Uh, the struggle against false teachers within the church, that is a big one. Uh, and as we'll learn shortly, that was a big problem in Asia, especially where it was from. Uh, also, the unity and the structure of the church. And then finally, his uh, desire to be faithful to Christ uh, as he faces the persecution being thrown into the lions. Um, there, and I apologize for this kind of like esoteric step back here, but there uh, in the past have been um, concerns about the authenticity of Ignatius's letters. Uh, we have a lot more uh, textual material now uh, than there was at the time of the Reformation. Um, there are three kind of uh, manuscripts uh, called the Long, Short, and Middle Recension. Uh, the Long Recension was the one available at the time of the early Reformation, Luther, Calvin, and such. Um, up until basically the English uh, Reformation, the, Purit well, the Puritan um, <coughs> movement in England. Now, this long recension contained not only the seven books that we view today as authentic, but a lot of, uh, well, six additional spurious fabrications from the fourth century by heretics. Uh, and so the only, the only set of these letters known to the early reformers was the ones that were mixed with the fake heresy. Um, it, was, it was the original fake news, so to speak. Uh, not the good news, the fake news. Um, now, there was also, unknown to the reformers, a uh, short recension, which was a Syriac abridgment. So this was taking the original seven letters, abridging them, cutting them down, just a smaller excerpt from them. That was in Syria, in Syriac. No way for uh, the reformers to have known that. No one knew Syriac. Um, at the time. People knew Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, but Syria was a completely different language. Um, in the mid-1600s, um, it was finally discovered the, the original, you know, closer to the original manuscripts, um, they were pretty much authenticated uh, by the mid-1600s and with modern, uh, modern knowledge and study uh, by great theologians and historians and uh, linguists, they have been fully authenticated now. There's really absolutely no dispute uh, that these were, in fact, um, letters written by Ignatius. He really was a bishop of Antioch. They were accepted uh, by the church as uh, setting forth the doctrine uh, of, of Christ and the gospel at that time. Like I said earlier, the early reformers didn't have access to this. Um, and of course, what they did have was the ones with the, the fabricated documents. So they threw the whole thing out and didn't consider this uh, as, as a true history. Um, that will come back kind of as a, as a problem later on. It led to a lot of confusion, a lot of infighting, especially in the English Reformation. Uh, especially the English Reformation. So uh, any questions so far? I apologize for that digression on textual criticism. Did he uh, study under anybody in particular? Ignatius? Yes. Um, Apostle, the Apostle John is uh, who he studied under. So. so yeah, so he became, he was an old man in 107, became a bishop around AD 70, which coincided uh, more or less with the, the time the Apostle John would have uh, died. Um, but he had been active in the church for some time before that, and John was very uh, active. There, there are discussions um, and letters with Polycarp uh, and uh, Ignatius. The two of them had been discipled and trained by John together. So if, if he, in fact, was 
uh, a child uh, at the feet of Jesus, uh, he would have only been 10 or 15 years younger than, than John and would have known John uh, from that time forward. Right, right. And again, again, we don't have firm written documentation of all this, but we don't have firm written documentation of a lot of things we assume, uh, merely because of tradition. I mean, we all assume that Mary was younger than Joseph, a teenager. Where is that in the scripture? You know, um, it, it's it's things that there's enough uh, enough uh, written or um, traditional statements to kind of assume, and it makes it makes sense. You look at the time. Um, there there are references in these letters to John, to Polycarp, to Paul, to Peter, uh, to Onesimus, who Paul discipled. Uh, Onesimus at the time of this actually was the recipient of one of these letters because he was the Bishop of Smyrna. So um, at the very least, he was in communication with all of those people because, again, he was a bishop of one of the biggest cities in the known world. So he would have, if he would have had communication <coughs> with any of the living apostles. And, uh, but yeah, pretty much thought um, it was the Apostle John, who of course was kind of the apostle over that area uh, in Asia. But these are the same churches he wrote the Apocalypse of the Revelation to. Uh, Smyrna, Laodicea, all, all of these churches around, uh, around where Ephesians uh, was. So it's really neat to see how it fits into um, the early church, you know, right after the scriptures were written, how it fits in. This is not uh, as was unfortunately taught by some of the reformers, and especially the secondary reformers <coughs> after, after them. Uh, they developed this whole theory that immediately after the apostles died, the church fell into chaos and disunity and schism and heresy, and it wasn't until the great reformers that it came back to the true church. That's absolutely false. Uh, it slid gradually into difficulty from around <coughs> the, the year 1000 to around the year 1500. So it, it, there was a thousand years where they aff affirmatively said, this is the scriptures. Um, they came up, they, they defended the Trinity. They defended the hypostatic union of Christ. Um, they developed the early creeds that we all subscribe to. Um, they had this first, or the seven church councils, the first four being the most important, and the next three kind of going into more detail. So these are the things that the church fathers and you know, the Apostolic fathers and the later church fathers did, uh, and they died for their faith. I mean, but so to say, you know, to, to just go back and say, well, because we don't like some of the abuses of Rome, and they had bishops, therefore, as soon as you have a bishop, the church is apostate, it was just a, a really bad idea, not only from a logical and exegetical view, but from a a view of Christianity and church unity. Jesus said, um, this is my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the idea that immediately after the apostles died, the church just fell apart, um, it's kind of ludicrous. Um, okay, so let's kind of, got about 12 minutes. Let's get into the organization of the church as it uh, is built up by Christ. Um, if someone could read, we're on uh, page three, I think, that Ephesians 2 section, uh, which is the first bullet point, um, you can read it from the, uh, from the handout here. Um, Jan, would you mind reading that? Sure. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Um, thank you, Jan. Ephesians 2, 18 through 22, one of the beautiful metaphors of the church um, speaking of Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone and the foundation of the apostles and prophets and uh, the entire church being built up as a spiritual house. So from this we see a couple of things. Uh, Ignatius believed, and, and I believe rightly believed, 
that the doctrines of the church and the unity of the church in the spirit should not and cannot change ever. Um, yet, there seems to be a, uh, if we look at Clement and we look at the New Testament writings and we look at these writings here, there seems to be a slight change or a slight development in some of the structural and functional aspects of church government. Uh, and so I think instead of uh, trying to look at Ignatius and fit him into our mold and say, you know, he was really a Presbyterian and he really, he really didn't believe in mono-episcopal government, or on the other hand saying he did agree <coughs> with it and he was wrong and he doesn't understand sola scriptura and he's bad, uh, we should look at it um, with an open mind and be willing to be challenged in our own belief and um, return to the scriptures uh, on all things. So let's kind of get try to get into, into, into Ignatius' mind here and see what was he thinking with regard to church government. And, and I think um, I didn't get a chance really to like pull out specific quotes, um, but I'm hoping that you'll get that 99% download or free download that Jane was telling about and just get the church fathers and read it for yourself and we can discuss them next time. And I'll try to bring in some specific quotes next time. But, um, so here are, um, uh, well let me first ask, just, there's no right or wrong answer here, but just your current thoughts. Does, uh, was Ignatius right in thinking that some structures in the church government, et cetera, can change? Who, just show of hands, who thinks he's right that that can change, okay? Um, who thinks he's wrong? You know, it's only in the scripture. If it doesn't say it in the scripture, then no. Who, who thinks that? Wow. Okay. We're 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 a, we're a Presbyterian Westminsterian church, and we actually none of us agree with the regular principle. So, um, which is fine because the regular principle isn't in scripture either. Um, so, we've got a we've got a, we've got a thing going here. Like we need to think about. So, just so back up. Sorry for that. Our tradition. And as a Presbyterian, uh, we have a tradition too. Uh, it's not only the Roman Catholics who have tradition, but our tradition is that uh, the concept of a bishop over the presbytery is wrong. Why? Because it's not in the Bible. Uh, and if it's not in the Bible, it's not allowed. It's, it's kind of a logical inference from sola scriptura, which morphed during the Continental Reformation and the English Reformation into the regulative principle. The regulative principle says that uh, with regard to worship in the church and government of the church, you, if it's not in the scriptures, it's not allowed. Um, yes, right. We also, I mean, we also infer that conclusion from verses which appear to be using the term elder and overseer as synonyms mm -hmm. and therefore we we conclude they were just describing the same office right. with different words i know the roman catholics look at that and they say or others say no there's particular elders who are overseers who have a higher ta a different task than regular elders yeah. But we, we, look, we view that differently and say, no, those were just synonyms for the same office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'm not arguing, and I don't believe most honest um, theologians and historians would argue that this single bishop concept was present during the time of the formate or the writings of the New Testament. Uh, there was clearly uh, some differentiation within the office of elder uh, because there are the, the statements that um, the elder who rules well, and especially those who teach, should be um, held, given great honor. Um, so, so there is within the eldership, so to speak, it's discussion of ruling and discussion of teaching. Uh, and although the Presbyterian Church in America, which we're a part of, uh, believes in a two-office church, we still make that distinction within the office of elder of a teaching elder and a ruling elder. Um, and as I've mentioned to Sean before, you know, he, he is a first among equals uh, in our in our local church. He, by virtue of his training, by virtue of his experience, his education, not to mention his calling <coughs> to full-time ministry, 
while we are technically uh, equal uh, in our vote on the session, which is our, which is our uh, governing body, um, Sean is held a little higher up, uh, even if it were just the other member of the session deferring to him uh, on, on things or valuing his opinion uh, highly. So it's very likely, as we talked about in Clement, that's kind of how this uh, concept of one person a little higher than the others got started. And again, it wasn't like we think of on the throne with the mitre uh, proclaiming God from on high. This bishop, Ignatius, the other bishops at the time, were humble men. Uh, they were men who preached the word and who administered the sacraments. Uh, but they did view the office of bishop as appointed by God. Uh, and they had some reasons for that, which we'll go into. So I, I think from a logical standpoint, and I'm, I apologize again for getting a little bit esoteric here, um, we have to ask the question, uh, because there is, I mean, all of you raised your hands and on this whole regular principle error issue. Uh, and I would say there are many, many um, teaching and ruling elders in the PCA who also disagree with the regular principle. Um, and it's led to kind of PCA worship wars in the last few years. But um, from a principle standpoint, is it, is it true or not? And I think we should ask ourselves, do we believe, can we point to any specific things that were present in the New Testament that we believe are invalid now? And if so, is there specific statements in the scriptures saying those were invalid? Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of the um, office of the apostle. Um, we believe that that ended when the 12 apostles died. Um, many people within our denomination and within Protestantism, and I think even Roman Catholicism, uh, believe that certain of the other um, gifts, the uh, spiritual gifts of uh, prophecy and tongues, also uh, are no longer uh, present in the church. However, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't seen anything in the scripture that says the pro gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongues are in it. Does anyone know where that's in there? Okay. So why do we believe it if we believe in sola scriptura? Well, I mean, it brings up the whole point. You know, when I'm saying something about the regulative principle, it's really my understanding or our understanding of the regulative principle. It's, it, and our understanding is limited, right. and our understanding can change if we see something different in scripture. So you have to be careful there because, you know, I I believe that in the regulative principle, mm -hmm. but it's how I understand the regulative, the, like regulative principle from scripture now, but that doesn't mean God can't reveal something else through the scripture. Right. It and might change that understanding. Did you all hear what Dennis said? It was very, very important. Um, and there is the crux of the problem. Right. Because if, we are all looking to scripture and we have, we're at different places in our spiritual walk. Uh, and some of us are hands on the body and others of us are heads and others of us are feet. Uh, so we have different gifts. So we're all looking at this from our own perspective and our own education and our own experience. So how do we interpret the scripture as God intended? And we mentioned a few weeks ago I believe that the only way we can do that is within the covenant community of the church that God given us. God has given us because if I'm off on my own and I'm just it's just me and the Bible, I'm going to fall into heresy because I have my own narrow white blinkers on as to what I think this text should say, and I have my experiences. I'm doing that, and that's what heresy was. It was Calling someone a heretic in the early church was not saying, you are condemned to hell. It was saying, you're thinking on your own. You're thinking outside the, um, you're thinking outside the church. You're not um, submitting yourselves to the government that God has placed over you. And so that was the goal of church government at the time and should still be the goal now, uh, to provide doctrinal unity, Unity of the spirit, unity of the organization, with the goal of having this one organism, uh, this one body of the church, growing up into Christ together. Uh, 
So, so, so very good. When we're all looking at it from our own perspective, that's fine. There should be different perspectives within the church because if we all have the same perspective, uh, nobody's getting challenged. But there has to be some type of governing structure uh, beyond me and my Bible. Okay. So because I mean, uh, the elders who are sitting in this room have seen this all before. Well. I am perfectly convinced from my understanding of the Bible and the Holy Spirit that I'm right and you're wrong. How do you argue with that? It's very subjective. Um, so that is why God gave the ordained ministry. And whether you view the ordained ministry as threefold with bishops, priests, and deacons, or whether you or, uh, view it as twofold, elders and deacons, isn't as big and uh, isn't as of great importance as do you believe God gave ordained ministry for the furtherance of the gospel, for the edifying of the church, and for the uh, unity of his people? So, yeah. just a comment on the gifts about uh, whether they are still um, present or not. Um, one thing we have in God's word is a description of, in different cases here, of the people who are exercising those gifts, such as an elder, and how those gifts should be used, such as gift of tongues. And so whether or not somebody believes that those are still active, if they are seeing or experiencing those, they should be done in a certain way. Right, of course. Yeah. In other words, we're not gonna have an elder that's uh, living like the devil and being called an no, elder. And, and it wasn't just the elders who practiced those gifts. Um, right. And, and in light of, and I won't get too much into a tangent, but it's 10 o'clock, so we can kind of go off the clock, so to speak. Um, the early church um, practiced some things that we would not historically and in our tradition practice. Um, and we have a tendency to add things to the scripture just as the Roman Catholics did it. But they, weren't, they don't have a monopoly on it. Um, they had women prophesying in church. Uh, and I think that aside from the prophecy, there would be people in the PCA today who, who have and do take umbrage um, with women having any type of um, public involvement in worship. And I think that's wrong. And um, once again, I think that what we need to do is take a step back from our entrenched views, which may or may not be based on scripture, and we need to be humble. Uh, and we need to view our brothers and sisters who differ from us uh, as more important than ourselves and give them uh, the benefit of the doubt if we disagree, not condemning them and judging them, uh, but also coming together and saying, well, let's talk about this, like they did in the <coughs> church. Uh, they had councils, they reasoned together, they looked to the scriptures uh, daily, the Bereans. Um, e even even with, with the writings of Paul, they were examining the scriptures to see if these things be so. So uh, instead of being dogmatic about some of these things that are very unclear, uh, I think that we should be open to, as the reformers themselves uh, constantly reminded us of the need to be reformed, yet always reforming. And reformation in the proper sense is not evolution, it is not development, it is not innovation. It's returning to the old paths that are in the scriptures and in the early church. It's, it's returning to what Christ wants the church to be. So the, without getting into the details, the key uh, thing we can take away from this in our, in our lives and the PCA and our church um, and our church is very united our, our local church, the PCA not so much but the, the solution to that is not a split in the PCA the solution to that is to come together to study God's word, to be humble uh, and to see how we can all follow Christ especially on the essentials and then not get all uptight about some of the non-essentials. And then beyond that, instead of continuing to split the body of Christ into little splinter groups, see if we can get back together. There's four or five Presbyterian Reformed congregations in America. There's no reason they shouldn't be together. There's no reason we shouldn't be in 
communion with Baptists or Anglicans who, who follow scripture, not certainly not the Episcopal Church US, but the Anglicans who follow scripture, other Reformed, other Baptists, the, the differences are very small. And it is only when the church is united that you have all the members of the body together and able to um, and, and, and able to be a united whole and be, be what God intended us to be. So um, I've gone over and I apologize, but let's, uh, let's close with it. Father God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for, uh, that, thank you that you view the church as the bride of Christ and that you uh, give yourself for her. You have given yourself for her. And continue to intercede uh, for your bride uh, before the throne of God. Thank you that one day when you return, uh, all will be made right, and that uh, your, uh, your body, which is so divided and uh, often at war now, will be uh, united in one whole and spotless bride. We pray that we would, uh, in our very small part, be able to participate in the uh, ongoing uh, sanctification of the church. That in our, in our, within our local church, within our denomination, within our circle of friends from other traditions, that we may uh, seek not only unity of the spirit, unity of doctrine, but also in the unity of word. And that we may set aside our pride and our uh, self-thought and look to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and to uh, the written word which he's given to us, and that we may uh, seek to be united uh, and uh, one whole body with him. And as we prepare for uh, worship, we pray that you be with Sean as he brings that word to us and as he breaks the, uh, the bread and that we participate in the body. We pray that we would uh, be reminded in that sacrament of uh, what we've learned in the lesson today of the united body of Christ throughout the world. And although we are in different denominations and often can't even take communion, and other traditions that, uh, in the mind of God, we are in fact one. And we thank you for that. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.